Oh, hey, John, I didn't see you in the back there. <laughs> anyway, let's get started here. Can you uh, go to the first slide there, Neil? I'm on Memories of a Programmer title page, kind of. That's right. Yeah. Okay, so good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Alex Taylor, and I'm a contractor with Arkanoa at the moment. And today I'll be talking a bit about some of the OS2 software that I've written. Next slide, please. About me. Yeah, a little about me. Um, I graduated about 17 years ago with a bachelor's degree in computer science, and subsequently about two months ago with a master's degree in media design. In between, I've worked in various jobs. Uh, my first job was actually OS2 support at a major insurance company in Canada. Subsequently, I also did Unix administration, uh, Lotus Domino, SAN support. Uh, then I decided to move to Japan to teach English. And for the past couple of years, I've done contract work as a software and UI developer slash consultant. As for what comes next, well, we'll see. Next slide, please. Okay, early OS2. <clears throat> Alright, so back around uh, 2000, um, just a little about how I started with OSU development. Around 2000, if you remember, Kim Chung proposed what was to become the first version of Ecom Station. And he started asking the community for ideas. So I sent some UI suggestions that I, I had, <clears throat> and I ended up being invited to join the volunteer development team that we were putting together. So mostly I started out just giving uh, advice on usability, user interfaces. I uh, also did some documentation, as I recall. But one of the main things that I suggested right off the bat was that ecom station should include a simple viewer for zip files and other archive formats. I don't know if you remember, but OS2 never actually included any graphical tool for viewing zip files. And that was a bit of a, of a gap. And so I said, look, guys, let's, let's include this so that people can actually double click on zip files and see what's in them, and maybe even extract them. And everybody said, yeah. That's a good idea. Somebody should write that. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, eventually I realized, okay, nobody else is going to do it, so I ended up writing one myself. Uh, after another member very kindly gave me his old copy of VX Rex. Uh, it was Nicky Moore, by the way, if anybody remembers him. And that was a good learning experience. Because uh, Archive Viewer, which is what I ended up writing, uh, it was the first major thing that I did in Rex. I used a little Rex as part of my old job, but I'd never done anything really large scale or complicated. So in the process of doing this, I learned enough Rex that I was able to start contributing to ECS development directly. Uh, a lot of the ECS development is actually, or was actually, um, on the installer side especially, uh, is done in Rex. So you glue bits and pieces of, of programs together and massage data and so on. So, um, I started contributing more and more on that side, and when ECS 1.0 came out, you may remember the install process was a bit mixed, um, the experience was a bit mixed. The user actually had to fire up the text mode LVM console if they wanted to partition their hard drive. And that was an awful thing to do to a user who isn't very technical because if you've ever used the LVM text mode console, it's like it's confusing even if you're a technical person. Or if you're not a technical person, it, it just doesn't make sense at all. So I realized that there is an API, a programmable API that, that could access the LVM functions. So I said, look guys, um, we've got this API, we could actually write a, a simplified GUI for LVM for people to use during ECS installation. Why don't we do that? Let's create a, just a GUI that strips out everything you don't need at install time and include that as part of the install. And everybody said, yeah, that's a good idea. <laughs> okay, you write one. So, uh, yeah, again, I ended up writing it myself. But 
uh, I basically had to teach myself presentation manager programming. Uh, I'd done a little C on the Unix text mode side, basically, in uh, university, but I'd never written any graphical applications in it. So I didn't have the advantage of any books like Petzold or any of the others. I literally had to open up the toolkit reference documentation and figure out how to write presentation manager applications. But it was a good experience, again. So with all this, by the time work started on ECS 1.2, uh, I learned enough about Rex and programming and the installed architecture to be able to sit down and completely rewrite the installation backend. Uh, the ECS 1.1 installer, while it included a very nice new GUI written by Alessandro Cantatore, um, the the way that it interfaced with the actual functional programs that it had to run in the background was a really awkwardly auto-generated monolithic rec script that was difficult to read, difficult to maintain. IBM was very edgy about supporting it, and it had some strange performance bottlenecks that we could never figure out. So I thought one day, um, well, IBM provides this framework for installation using Rex and various utilities called SID, which actually is specifically designed to do exactly what we're trying to do in the installer. So why don't we use it? So I, I learned my lesson by this time. I didn't go to the group and say, hey, why don't we? I just sat down and started playing with it. <laughs> in a couple of weeks, uh, actually, I got um, good enough at, at, at learning how this worked. I was able to put a new framework together to run the entire ECS installation back in. So I passed that back to the development team, and it was adopted for ECS 1.2. And in fact, that architecture that I designed is still largely in use in ECS 2, uh, even today. So I've gone on a bit about this, but uh, I do have a point. And if there's a lesson in all of this, it's that you don't have to start out as an expert, or even knowing very much at all, to contribute to OSD development. And I realize I'm probably preaching to the choir here. Um, but, you know, just find something you're interested in and contribute however you can, even if it's as simple as testing, by writing documentation, offering feedback, and so on. Uh, you can actually learn a lot by doing this, and eventually you may be able to end up being able to contribute more than you ever thought possible. No expert, you know, as to or anything else, ever started out as an expert. It's all gradual learning. So just start somewhere simple, keep on playing with it, and who knows where that can take you. Next slide, please. Okay, my OS2 software. Okay, so onto my actual OS2 software. Uh, I mostly decide to write a program because it's something that I personally need or want, or occasionally because I somehow acquired a temporary interest in the topic, uh, or I've been bored lately. Um, most of my software is available on my home page, uh, or on my GitHub page, or both, and the links are on the uh, slide there. You can contact me by email. That's my main email address up there. Uh, although I can't promise that I will reply qu quickly. Seriously, I'm very bad at answering emails. Uh, it's not uncommon for me to take weeks to get around to replying. If you want to reply, and I haven't answered in a, a week or two, feel free to send me a polite reminder. Maybe I'll get the message. Next slide, please. Okay, various utilities. Okay, so here's a quick rundown of some of my software uh, over the next few slides. I'll talk in more detail about some of these later on. I've written, first of all, a number of small utilities, starting with Archive Viewer. Uh, also, there's UniClock, which is a world-time applet with some special features, uh, which I will talk about a bit more later. Uh, several of my utilities deal with text encoding and conversion. Uh, that, that, that I have to work with text in different languages, which is quite off. And there's just a couple of them listed there. Next slide. Okay, so installation and configuration tools. Uh, Mini LVM isn't the only tool that I've written along these lines, but some of these programs that you see here are fairly obscure or specialized. Uh, TCPIP Profile Manager will be discussed later. Um, so will Yumi. 
Maps is a simple GUI for network adapter uh, and protocol configuration. It's designed to replace the MPTS GUI, except for some very specialized functions. If you've used the Ecom Station 2.2 beta, you've probably seen it. It's much faster and easier to use than MPTS, and it also fixes or circumvents various bugs and other problems with MPTS. You know, like having more than 127 NIST files in their uh, IBM Cloud directory. Uh, LAN inst was a simple GUI for installing LAN server on an OS2 work before we come to the HTTP system. Uh, it was actually written for an older version of Ecom Station, I think version 1.2. Uh, I'm not sure if I ever released it publicly, but in any case, it's been more or less superseded in later versions of ECS since I eventually integrated that functionality into the graphical installer. Um, the Ecom Station remote install tool that supported installing Ecom Station uh, version 2.1 and I think 2.2 beta over a network. With, that's for systems with bad output and CD drive. Um, how it works is basically the same as the old IBM Work 4 remote installer used to work. You boot off a set of floppies, it loads network drivers, it accesses the server, and installs the entire operating system, everything, over the network. You don't need a CD. Now, I did release a working beta of this. Uh, I think it's on the beta zone, probably. But I shelved the project when I realized that a computer that doesn't have a CD drive Nowadays, it's probably even less likely to have a floppy drive. So, um, it's of limited usefulness. I was hoping to figure out a way to support booting off USB sticks, but I never managed to come up with a practical solution. Uh, uh, next slide, please. Number uh, seven. Right? Printing number Printing. seven, yeah. So, I've written several things related to printing. Uh, Cups Wizard, obviously, is for installing Cups printers. PM Printer Manager is designed to be a centralized tool for printer management, and I'll talk more about that later. ePrint is a simple command line program that I wrote to replace print.com, the built-in OS2 print command. Its main strength is that it supports printing to ports other than parallel and serial ports exclusively. So, that includes not only USB ports, but also network ports like SLPR and SMB. It's on my website, if you're curious. PS Print is a replacement postcode printer driver for uh, OS2, ECS, and uh, Blue Lion uh, in the future. I'll talk more about it later uh, as well. Next slide, please. Font support. Okay, fonts are one of my major interests, so naturally I've written some programs for dealing with them. Font name is a simple command line tool to dump true type, open type, font name, strings, CMAPs, various tables, and some other information. Font info is a simple program, except it's a GUI instead of command line. Uh, these programs are handy for debugging fonts, but if you're not into developing fonts or font drivers, they're probably not all that useful to do. Um, what might be useful is FreeType 2. This is a replacement font driver for OS2 Presentation Manager. Um, there's, there are two different versions of this that I'm maintaining, uh, and I will talk more about this one uh, on a later slide as well. Next slide, please. Some wish list items? Um, wish list items, yes. I have a very large wish list. Um, by wish list, I mean things that I really like to do if I have the time someday. And these are just a few of the more interesting items on it. The ones in green I've actually done some work on, but that shouldn't be taken to mean that they'll ever actually happen. It depends on if I have time, if I can get my skills up to the, the, the level that's necessary, uh, and so on. Uh, time is a bit limited, so unless there are any questions about any of these, uh, I think we'd better continue. Next slide, please. My usual development environment? Yeah, so most of my programs are written in either C or Rex, or both in a few cases. Uh, I don't use C++. For C, I use either the IBM or GCC compiler, depending on various factors. For graphical applications, I generally use the PM API directly. For Rex, I use Classic, not Object Rex. For graphical Rex programs, I use Wacom VX Rex, usually in combination with my own library of custom controls that I've written for it. It's called VR Objects, by the way. It's on my website. 
Uh, I have done a few things in Java, but not a great deal, and not for several years. I think the last version of Java that I actually used was 1.4 or something. Um, I should probably get uh, more up to speed on that, actually, when I have time. Uh, I don't generally use integrated development environments other than the XREX. Uh, for mo most programming, a meant text editor, which has its limitations, but if you're aware of what they are, then it is actually a very nice programmer's editor. Next slide, please. Uh, look at selected programs. All right. So now I'm going to take a slightly more in-depth look at some selected programs. Next slide, please. Archive viewer. Archive viewer. You probably all have seen this one. It's been included in Ecom Station since 1.0 or 1.1. I don't quite remember. Uh, when I wrote this, uh, I deliberately chose to make it crude, not especially attractive, and limited in features. And I did that because uh, there were several um, archive viewers, managers, actually on the market at the time. I think there was Warp Zip, Zip Control, uh, more recently the Zippy. And because this was going to be included in the operating system, I didn't really want to pull a Microsoft and undercut the market for people who are actually trying to make a living off selling similar programs. So that's why it's very crude. Um, that said, I do update it uh, periodically. The uh, latest version is GPL. It's available from my website. And one thing that you might not have uh, realized about the latest version is that you can actually view individual files now without extracting the entire archive. So you might want to check that out if you're interested. I'm not going to give a demo of this one because you've all probably seen the program before. Next slide, please. OK. DBCS map. All right. DBCS map. This is a character map for Unicode and selected DBC double white code pages. DBCS map is probably not the best name for it because it actually is primarily a Unicode character map now. Um, you can copy multiple characters to the clipboard and uh, text. Well, actually, I'll show you. One second while I switch over to my VM. Okay, so you can all see my screen here? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Double Byte Character Map is the name of the program. <clears throat> this is what it looks like. Um, it comes up by default in Unicode mode. If you're familiar with how Unicode is laid out, there are basically um, 256 pages of 255 code points. Not all of which, but a large number, majority of which, are specific individual characters. So the first page is your basic Latin one character set. This looks familiar to most of you, I'm sure. Uh, if we go to page two, I've got some more, uh, slightly more specialized Latin characters. Go to page three, we get um, whatever this is. I think even more obscure Latin characters. IPA, maybe. Well, no, IP is a separate block, but anyway. Uh, page three, we've got Greek, uh, as well as various accents, diacritics. Page four, we get Cyrillic. Page five, we get into Hebrew. Page six, we get into Arabic, and so on. Um, skipping up to page 20, uh, we get some punctuation characters that are more specialized than what you find on the keyboard, some more interesting characters here. And all of these characters you can copy to the clipboard just by double-clicking on them. Box drawing characters. Oh, look at this, the card suit um, characters. You just gonna know, you love these. So, um, I'll show you how, this, how the copying works. Uh, what I will do is I'll just copy a string in a couple of languages here. But first of all, let's look at the option menu. And by default, this option here, copy Unicode, um, I think it actually defaults to off. Generally, you should turn it on because it makes the program a lot more useful. So when you, when you have this turned on, copy Unicode, whenever you copy a character, 
to the clipboard. You can do that by double clicking on it. And the characters that are being copied appear in the little box down below. I'm just going to say, hello, and then some more obscure characters just to show you how it works. I don't know. Have a heart. And how about Greek? Uh, and I'll give you one more symbol character just because I can. How about musical notes? So here I've got a string of characters that are, they have been copied to the clipboard now, and they've been copied in two formats. They've been copied in plain text format. If I open something like the basic system editor, and paste it, it gets copied in raw UTF-8. But... So that means each octet is rendered as a nasty character? Each, each character, yes. Um, some, some of the characters are represented as two or three ASCII characters. Right, right, right. But, what if I paste into a Unicode-aware application like Firefox? And I probably should have opened this before I started, but oh well. <laughs> so I'll just type this. I'll paste the same string into the text field here. Look at that. We got all the special characters, including the ones that don't exist in my system code page. So um, another feature of EVCS Map, by the way, is if you access if you copy something else into the clipboard from another program, you can actually come back to DDCS map, and if you still have the characters down here, in the edit menu you can say recopy all, and it'll add everything that's in the copy characters box back into the clipboard, just in case you decide you want to copy it back again. Um, it's a little a handy feature that I sometimes find quite useful. So that's DDCS map, it's on my website. The next program, uh, can I go to the next slide, please, Neil? Okay, context. Context, yes. So this is my convert text utility. It's a very simple tool for converting text from one encoding or code page to another. It also supports Unicode conversion and uh, clipboard, but it doesn't display Unicode. It's limited to actually displaying text in the current code page. But watch this. I have that string of Unicode characters in the clipboard, from the ECS map. The top field here is an editable field. I can type text in there, I can paste text in there. This box here indicates the current code page that's used for this top box. Right now it's set to the standard 850 code page. If I paste that Unicode string into this box, it will convert it to code page 850. And as you can see, half the characters get replaced with little symbols because they don't exist in code page 850. Make sense? However, if I change this code page to, for example, UTF-8 and paste again, I get the whole string converted to UTF-8. Or, you remember that I had some Greek in that string? <coughs> so let's try switching to the Greek code page, 869, paste the string again, and these characters get converted into the Greek code page. Now, the output text, this is if you have the text in the top box and you want to convert it into yet another code page. So, I have this text that's in code page 869. Now, I'll go, I'll go back to code page 850, and instead what I'll do, I'll recopy this, and then, um, Oh, give me any other code page. How about code page 1004? Windows Latin 1. If I say convert this text from code page 850 to Windows Latin 1, it actually looks exactly the same because the characters happen to be the same in both code pages, but you get the idea. So this program can be useful if you get a file or something that's not in code page 850 or whatever code page you happen to want it in. You can just paste the text in here, click convert, uh, select the code page that you want it in, Quick convert and so on. Uh, this uh, 
I haven't updated this program in a while, but it's, it's fairly useful, I think. Next slide, please. Universal clock? Universal clock, or UniClock. Now, this is an alternative to <clears throat> ECS clock, um, world clock, etc. You may remember that some earlier versions of ECS included a, a clock program that could display multiple time zones. That got taken out in version 2 by request of the author. So I thought we should replace it with something, uh, not just for ECS, but for all of us, the users, but with a twist. I thought, what if, instead of just creating one monolithic program that lets you show multiple time zones, what if I create a new type of PM uh, presentation manager control that could be embedded in any application and show time in any time zone? So that's what I did. UniClock itself is basically a wrapper application around a custom presentation manager control, which I call the WTD panel, or World Time Display Panel. So here we see UniClock. I've configured two different clocks, one showing Japan time, one showing UTC time. So what I think I'll do now is add a third clock that shows Kansas time. So, so um, if you right click anywhere on this, you can open the global program settings or the properties for the current clock if you see the dotted line appear around the current uh, select clock panel. But I will say, I will choose neither of those. I will choose add clock. So if I say add clock, uh, you get the properties for the new clock, and I will call it um, uh, US Central. Now, unfortunately, uh, well, uh, the clock's time zone is configured by using a time zone string, an OS2 standard format TZ string. Unfortunately, I haven't yet implemented a proper database and editor for this, but you can get TZ string generators uh, from various sources. There's actually one included in one of my other programs, clock synchronization, so I'll just fire that up uh, to cheat and get the correct time zone string for uh, United States. Central time zone and observe daylight saving time. So here's the time zone string that I want. And I'll just cancel out of that. And now paste this into my application here. Um, I'll set the time format to system default, turn off seconds display because I find it annoying. Date format also to system default. Uh, you also see alternate. Here, that actually does nothing yet. It's a future feature which I haven't implemented yet. Then we've got appearance on the other tab. <coughs> you can change the font. I like to use MMPM digital for my clock panels because it gives a nice digital effect. Background color, I don't know. Let's call to sort of medium sea blue. Why not? Foreground color, white will do. That'll do. So, add that, and there we go, U.S. Central Time. It's 8.43 a.m., is that right? Yeah. Yep. Okay, good. So, um, each panel has several different display formats. The default one, which you see here, uh, has the time in the middle, the name of the time, oh, the name of the, that I've given it at the top, and the date at the bottom. However, um, it also has what I call a compact display mode, and I've designed this program so that once they shrink below a certain size, it will, it will switch them automatically to compact format. There we go. And something not quite right with the uh, display there, but that's all right. Oh, I know why. Right? So program settings, there we go. Okay, program settings. Uh, you can turn it on and off the title bar if you want. Without a title bar, you can just drag it around to the right mouse. Um, you can put the clocks into multiple panels, um, sorry, multiple rows. Oops. The uh, properties dialog is not perfect yet. It's a little, um, it's a little quirky. Uh, I mean, it's a little incomplete, but okay, there we go. But I do hope to add more features to this as time goes by. Uh, this is not on my website this program, by the way, because it's still 
not very polished, it's kind of incomplete, but it is, uh, there's a release available on my GitHub page. So if you're interested, uh, you can check that out. And I'm hoping to be able to have a new release available fairly soon. So that's just a quick tour of UniClock. Next slide, please. TCPIP Profile Manager. Yeah, I'm actually running a bit uh, short on time here, so I'm not going to give a demo of this one. But this is a program that lets you create different TCPIP configurations on one computer and switch between them. I created this because back when I was teaching at several different schools, some of my schools I had to have static IP address, some of them I needed DHCP but a static route, others I needed full DHCP, at home I was using full DHCP. I didn't want to have to go in and reconfigure TCP IP every time I went from one school to another and came home again. So I wrote this program so I could just switch my TCP IP configuration with a couple of presses of a button. So if you're interested, this program is on my website and uh, I suggest you might want to check it out if you would find it useful. Uh, next slide, please. Cups Wizard. Yes. Cups Wizard. Uh, I'm not going to demo this one as well, uh, but it's a simple wizard for creating cups based OS2 printers. The whole idea is that it shields you from having to mess around with the whole process that's in the described on the cups wiki, where you have to go into the cups web admin GUI, then create the cups queue, then go into OS2, create the OS2 printer object, then go and create a port that points to the right cups queue, and it's it, blah. No, I just created this wizard, it guides you through it, it automatically creates the printer object and the cups queue and the port, hooks them all up the way they're supposed to be, and it also automatically cleans, um, pre-processes any PDE files that you have to import, um, so that hopefully you're not going to get any problems with PIN as you can sometimes, as I believe Paul is going to be mentioning. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah. Next slide. PM okay. Printer Manager. PM Printer Manager. Uh, this is my unified printer manager. Um, it's. <clears throat> I don't know if you um, noticed, but in ECS, um, there was an effort over the various releases to try and include several tools to make managing printers easier. There was InstPDR, which automated importing, well, an automated streamline importing PPD files. There was ECS Print, which was a slightly simplified GUI for just creating a new printer object. Um, if you had, if you ever deleted a printer, there was also this utility from Faxworks, PRNDRV, where you had to actually go and clean up the any file because it didn't properly clear out the old printer whenever you deleted one. So. And if you wanted to create a cups printer, of course you had to use the, either the cups wizard or the cups admin good. So you were getting up to three or four different programs just to do basic printer management. So I figured enough, just write a one-stop shop for managing printers, both normal and cups. So that became PM Printer Manager. It is available on my website. Um, it's also in uh, Netlands SVN. I'm Still, I'm like, it's not finished, but it's fairly functional. Um, I believe it was included in the ECS 2.2 beta. Um, it will, I hope, be included in Blue Lion. And um, some of the things that I'm planning to do with it maybe uh, will come about over the next uh, few months. Fingers crossed. So, uh, I won't demo this either because, again, running a little short of time. Next slide, please. APS print. Okay, PS print. Some of you may know what this is, some of you might not. This is an enhanced replacement for the OS2 PostScript printer driver. This is one of the most ambitious projects that I've ever undertaken. It replaces P, or it's intended to replace PScript.drb, the PostScript printer driver. Um, it includes all fixes from uh, Paul's eCups DRB plus a number of other fixes. Um, but the main feature of this driver is that it supports embedding true type fonts 
to the fridge on. And if you don't know what that means, basically, when you print text to a printer, to a PostScript printer, um, the ideal way of doing it is to tell, is to literally embed commands in the printer job file that says, this is the text, this is the sequence of text that I want printed, this is the font that I want you to print it in. Go and do it. The problem is, if the printer doesn't know what that font is, it can't do it. So, the PostScript printer driver knows what fonts the printer is aware of, and if the printer is not aware of that font, what it either does is it actually includes a copy of the font itself, or a subset of it, in the job file and sends the whole thing to the printer. Or if it can't do that, it just converts all of the text to a bitmap image and sends that to the printer. With the IBM PScript driver, it was capable of embedding type 1 PostScript files, you know, the AFM, OFM, PFM files, uh, type of font. It could not do that with two type fonts, which meant that if you ever printed a document to a good quality laser printer, a uh, PostScript laser printer, any text that was in a PostScript font looked beautiful, any text that was in a two type font looked slightly less than beautiful. If you didn't have a very high quality printer, you didn't necessarily notice the difference, but if you did, it was painfully obvious that to a more than casual inspection that OS2, documents printed from OS2 did not look as nice as documents printed from Windows. And the reason was because the PScript driver cannot embed true type fonts, which most of us are using these days. So PS print was designed to fill that um, gap. It can embed true type fonts. I will see if I can show you an example of the difference here. Uh, what was that? So here's an example of an actual PostScript file that I printed using the IBM PScript driver. Uh, this was from OpenOffice. And here's the same, exact same PostScript file printed from, uh, printed using the PS print driver. Now, I don't know how good the quality of the screen you're getting um, over the projector is. I'm not sure if you can see the difference between these two uh, documents. Can you actually see any difference between these from where you are? No. no. Yeah, probably not, right? It's a little bolder. Yeah, the, the, the top one is darker. Here's a slightly enlarged view. The top one, again, is the old PScript driver. The bottom one is the PS print driver. And you can see these images on my website, if you can't see them clearly here. But the top one looks much more sort of jagged and ugly than the bottom one. The bottom one looks really smooth and beautiful. <coughs> and you will see this difference, albeit at a much smaller scale, when you actually print. So that's just a quick overview of what the PS print driver does. Now, does that, I, does that yeah. work with, like, Japanese might be more dramatically affected by this kind of stuff than English, you know, Latin alphabet? Possibly, yeah. Uh -huh. um, there are issues... The thing is, Japanese fonts are usually so big, you can't really embed them in, the, in a job file anyway. Yeah. Um, there's, a, there's a sanity limit on, on how big the font can be. If it's bigger than something like a, mega, a megabyte, then it will never be embedded. And that's just for safety. I don't want to blow up the printer's memory or cause something wrong with it. And most of yeah. these fonts are, you know, in the order of half a meg to eight or nine megs in size. Um, but anyway, um, I've classified this as a preview release. It's on my website, uh, described as such. But the last couple of releases, I think, are actually pretty stable. So you might want to check it out if you haven't already. And it is compatible with CUPS as well, which the IBM PScript driver isn't. Uh, next slide, please. Free type 2. Free type 2 IFI. Okay, this is a replacement for OS2's true type font driver. This is 
This improves the appearance of true type fonts on the screen as opposed to when written. There are a couple of versions of this. It's been around uh, for quite a long time, actually. Uh, Mikal wrote the earliest version, I think almost 20 years ago now. Um, it's been bounced around between a couple of different maintainers since then. Uh, eventually ended up with me. I released version 1.3, uh, which adds a number of configuration options, including a nice graphical uh, configuration tool, uh, some improvements for DBCS, I should say double byte or East Asian fonts, and also provides a workaround for certain printing problems in OpenOffice. That one's on my website. What is not on my website, but is on my GitHub page, is a new version 2.0. And this is another very ambitious project, which I've been working on for the last few years. This heavily rewrites the free type um, DLL. I renamed it ft2ifi.dll just to disambiguate it. Based on the much later, much more advanced free type library version 2. And the main advantage this gives is that it adds support for open type fonts in OS2, OTF fonts. If you've ever bought or used or tried to install, if you've got them from some um, software package or whatever, open type, uh, well, high quality fonts, you'll notice that they almost all come in OTF format these days. So, with Free Type 2 IFI version 2.0, you can now use open type fonts under OS2, including in programs that don't actually use it to render them, like OpenOffice and Mozilla. Now, OpenOffice and Mozilla don't use the OS2 presentation manager and thus do not use this DLL to draw fonts, but they do use this DLL to find out what fonts are installed on the system. So it is still useful for applications like OpenOffice and Mozilla. And it's a little difficult to give you a proper demonstration of this, but just as, uh, for something quick, I'll open my fonts folder here. And amid all of these usual fonts, you notice what I've got here is Adobe Caslon Pro regular, and look at that, it's an OTF file. We could never use these under OS2 before. Now we can. This is an open type font. Uh, another example, century old style, OTF font. Now it works under OS2. But, unfortunately there is a caveat. This DLL has been stuck in beta for quite a while because there are some lingering bugs that I have not yet been able to figure out. And it's very hard to debug this because the built-in hooks for debugging the free type library don't work in this environment. And it has to do, I think, with the fact that this DLL runs in privileged space as part of Presentation Manager, not as uh, a smaller scale application. Uh, according to Mikhail's notes, you actually need to use a kernel debugger to properly trace what's going on inside this DLL. Unfortunately, I cannot use a kernel debugger because, first of all, I don't know how, and second of all, I don't have any computers with serial ports. So, yeah, I'm a bit stuck with this, and I'm hoping, I don't know, if anybody uh, is an expert in this kind of thing, talk to me. <laughs> I might want your help. But, these bugs are not showstoppers. You can still install this and gain the full benefit of open type font support in Mozilla and OpenOffice. So if you're interested in doing that, by all means check this out. It's on my GitHub page. Not on my website, but it's on my GitHub page. All right, next slide, please. <clears throat> special preview? Yes, now a special preview. And next slide. Hey, yummy. The Arkanoa Package Manager. The eventual name is still to be determined. Uh, right now we call it Yummy, which is kind of a backronym for a young interface for end users. But ultimately, it's intended to support more than just Yum. It's a, uh, we're, gonna, we're planning to support warping packages eventually. And it's got a lot of features that are specific to uh, Arkanoa's um, 
offerings. Uh, well, it has a feature where you can actually access a protected, a password protected repository like those offered by Arcanoa for its subscription offerings. That's working now. Um, I don't think the actual repository is, is really um, fully in place yet. But the program itself is actually just about ready, I think, for a first release. We're just um, waiting on a few things like uh, finalizing the help file and getting it through our, uh, our beta testers. But here's what it looks like. This is the application that Lewis has been promising us uh, you, that we have been promising you uh, for a number of months. And I uh, apologize that it's taken a while, but we have been working hard on this, and it is almost ready for release. It's quite usable now. So, this is designed to take the pain out of using YUM and installing RPM packages. We have the main window here. You see two categories on the side. They are installed packages, and available packages, which means packages which have not been installed, but which are available on the server-based repository. So, uh, you see a whole list of packages that I already have installed. The ones in yellow uh, are just normal packages. The ones with the green star on it are packages which actually have updates available on the server. So if I wanted to, I could update these packages to a newer version. I can filter the list here, by the way. Um, every package, for example, has a, cat has a group. Like, what kind of application is it? So you see, like, applications, development, libraries, um, system environment. So if you only want to view packages from a certain group, you can filter those out. So let's just take a look at applications. So those are the, applica those are the packages that I have installed in the applications category. These are the packages that are available, but that are available in the applications category, and there are quite a few. Uh, how about development? Okay, there are a lot of packages in the development category that are available. I, I even have some of them installed. The default view is all groups. Um, by the way, uh, you might appreciate this. There is actually a description of each package shown in the main window, which is kind of useful if you don't know what a package does, just from its name. That's one of the weaknesses of the young command line. If you don't know what a package is, you just know its name, like it could be anything. But here we have a, a brief description of what it is, and you can actually get more detailed information. For example, let's take a look at ash. What is ash? Well, let's highlight it and select the info button. And here we get details about this package. It is a smaller version of the Boin shell. Uh, and then there's a longer description here. Here's the version and information about the package that I have installed. And here's the information about the newer package that's available on the repository. So, I can also actually take a look at what the files are inside this package. I can right click and choose contents or click on the view package contents button. So this package contains only two files, ash.exe and ash.1, which is a, a Unix style manual page. So that looks harmless enough. Um, as you can see, there's a star, a green star on it, which means it's available, uh, there's an update available. So what I think I'll do now is I'll install the update. So, Use the installer update package, click that. It checks, oh, look at this. Ash, unfortunately, has a lot of dependencies. So, maybe I want to think twice about just upload, uh, updating it. <coughs> what we see here is that if I want to update this package, it's going to have to update all of these other packages too. So, maybe I don't want to do that right now. Why don't I choose something a bit simpler? How about... Um, Zedlin. What's Zedlin? This is compression decompression library. Can we update this one? Oh, there we go. This is simple. If I want to update Zedlin, there's just one package to download. And it's 54 kilobytes, nice and small. So I'll just say OK and let it download the package. 
So it downloads it, installs it, updates it, boom, there we go. Zedlib has now been updated. Now, sometimes you may come across a program which tells you, if you want to install this, you need to install the following RPM packages. And it gives you a long list of, you know, anybody tried to install OpenOffice? Yeah. It says you need like six or seven or eight different um, RPM packages. And it says, well, to install them, you have to go to the command line type yum install, uh, I don't know, lib in, lib standard c, uh, c++ 6, uh, lib chi, but a whole bunch of things. However, one feature we've added is that you can just take this list of package names and quick install is an option where if I can just enter the list of package names that I want to install, I can just copy and paste it from the readme file. So this one, and oh, they're already up to date. Oh well. <laughs> you can also say update all. This will update every package which has updates available. You might want to use this with caution because it can download a lot if you haven't updated it in a while. I mean, let's see what happens here. Um, yeah, these are all of the updatable packages right now. It's 21 megs of downloads. So, yeah, I don't think I want to do that. And actually, the packages that it has to update include Yum itself. So that's going to include some, yeah, let's not deal with that just now. But it's useful that you can do all of this in a simple point and click graphical uh, interface, which gives you much more information than you could get from the Yum command line. Um, by the way, you can also filter out uh, different uh, statuses of package. For instance, if I only want to view packages with updates, I can select that. If I only want to view packages that have been recently added to the repository, I can do that. But it looks as if nothing's been recently added in the last week or so, so that list is empty. Also, I can view only the packages on a particular repository. But I only have one repository, NetLabs rel, and so you only see one option there. Speaking of repositories, you can add repositories. There's a repository manager. NetLabs, NetLabs rel is the default one. It's the, uh, the one that's obviously run by NetLabs. Uh, on an ECS system, version 2.2, you will also see an ecom station install CD, which is actually a repository itself, although after the install, it will be disabled. And you can also edit the configuration files by just saying edit, and it'll open the configuration file for that repository in a text editor. You know, use this with caution. If you're not really comfortable with Yum, I don't recommend playing around with these settings. But you can sit, it's very simple to just add and remove repositories. Add a repository, you just add the name, like, I don't know, Arkanoa, rel, and then blah, 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 whatever the URI you're given. And there's an option for secure repository, and that tells it that this is a repository that requires a user ID and password according to the system that we at Arkanoa have devised which is actually very secure. It hashes the password locally and never sends it out over the wire, so it can't be sniffed out. It's, um, it's encrypted. The encrypted hash is sent out using um, OpenSSL. We didn't, uh, we didn't really skimp on security here, even though, I don't know, you're probably thinking, you know, this is not a nuclear reactor, why, why so? Um, <laughs> Why so finicky about security? It's a good habit to get into. And you know, I think uh, Lewis, and, and I agree with this, takes, uh, takes security uh, quite, quite seriously. So that's a quick tour of the features of this program. And I see we're pretty much out of time, which is good because if you go to the next slide, please, we come to the end of my presentation. Question time. No one has any questions around I, I could ask one. Uh, the the Unicode stuff you demonstrated, how, how does Unicode work on OS2? Is it internally UTF-16, or what? how does it work? 
Um, internally, it is manually UTF. Yeah, internally it's UCS uh, UTF sixteen. Yeah, which is is actually UCS two, which is a subset of UTF sixteen. It only supports what's called the basic multilingual plane. Right. Um, OS2 Presentation Manager, or rather the GPI portion of it, actually does support Unicode. It has Unicode display capability. Mm -hmm. The problem is, first of all, it's kind of incomplete and a bit buggy. And second, the standard Presentation Manager controls were never updated to support this. So if you want to display Unicode in Presentation Manager, you basically have to write your own custom controls, uh -huh. which is unfortunate. That's actually what I've done with the DDCS map and one or two other applications that, uh, that use Unicode. Um, and does, uh, does OS2 has no UTF-8 support? I didn't know about that probably. Uh, it does. OS2 okay. actually does support UTF-8 as well. Um, you can even display UTF-8 natively, but it's very slow. Uh -huh. um, I mean, I actually, early version of this program, I think I tried to use UTF-8 um, for display, but if I change to a new window like this, uh, to a new page like that, mm -hmm. changing the uh, page, it would have taken literally about three or four seconds to paint that screen instead of just flashing if I'd used UTF-8. But UTF-8 support in OS2 is very useful for actually doing conversions. Mm -hmm. And I believe uh, PM Mail uses that support, for example, to support so to understand and interpret UTF-8 formatted messages. And is that a feature of Presentation Manager? Uh, it's part of Presentation Manager, yes. <coughs> the conversions are, yeah, okay. The conversion is, yes. And even the display is, but as I said, the display has some performance problems, and it's a bit buggy. For example, it doesn't work very well with monospace plots for some reason. So if you want to do any kind of serious displaying of Unicode in Presentation Manager, it's probably better to use an external library like FreeType. Okay. As of speaking to programmers, um, I mean, if you're not a programmer, it would be different since someone in VS Code. Uh, um, and manage printers uh, or its PDR. What do you do to clean the uh, PPD file? What 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 is clean? What what is cleaned out of it? What is cleaned out? Well, there's actually a rec script that Paul Smith has provided called Clean PPD um, for cups. Since PDR is written in Rex, it actually includes pretty much a copy-paste of that Rex script, oh. with some of my own additions. What it does is it strips out stuff that the pin utility that's included with the PostScript drivers um, doesn't understand and will crash on. Mm. Unfortunately, pin is a truly awful program. Um, it's, if you've ever seen the code, um, and you know anything about good programming, design, you will, you will, it will give you nightmares. <clears throat> and it is difficult to modify, difficult to debug, difficult to extend, and it suffers from severe problems because nowadays a lot of PPD files are too big and too complicated for it to properly handle. So more and more, unfortunately, we are seeing PPD files that even if we clean it, PIN just cannot handle. And sometimes PIN will simply crash trying to install it. That's the good scenario. The bad scenario is when PIN appears to work but writes corrupted data in the driver uh, pack file. And that's a problem. Um, that's one reason that it, we generally, well, there are many reasons that we generally recommend people to use CUPS nowadays. That is yet another one because CUPS PPD files, generally speaking, are more likely to be able to be handled because they have more of a standardized format and set of commands. Uh, Alex, have you, have you considered uh, using, I don't know, more about a QT programming or the QT libraries for your programs? Uh, do I do it? Or do you consider it? Um, not, not yet. I'm actually kind of starting to study 
Qt programming. The thing is, I have no real C++ programming experience, um, and Qt requires C++. Also, most of the programs I've written have either been in Rex, or have, for whatever reason, kind of had to be written using Presentation Manager. Um, yeah, for new applications, Qt is an excellent way to go, I would say. Um, but the thing is, a lot of us have to deal with programs that we've inherited, or legacy programs, or programs which, for some reason, we're stuck with the Presentation Manager API. So, how is that? Yeah. But yeah, Qt is uh, certainly should its use should probably be encouraged. It does give us a very, very powerful um, graphical library that is head and shoulders above what Presentation Manager can do. Thanks. Usually, I've seen it as a. Can, can you speak up? I can't really hear you. What has been done? Maybe get closer to the mic. What has been done in the young RPM GUI to try and circumvent DLL conflicts on the existing systems where you deploy young for the first time? Because I have seen that at user group meetings in the Netherlands, where people have an existing system, and then there are double DLL versions floating around. I'm glad you asked, actually. Um, I probably should have mentioned that. The um, Arduino Package Manager does include a facility where, in fact, whenever you go to install a package which contains DLLs or EXEs, it will search the system. Um, not only it will search the lib path in the case of DLLs, but also it will check for any already loaded instances of that DLL. And it'll warn you, hey, look, you're installing a package which contains DLLs which have the same name as a DLL which is already running on your system. Please be aware that this can cause problems. You might want to either reconsider installing this package or else uninstall whatever it is that included the other DLL. I'll see if I can find an example. I don't remember exactly how much I've cleaned up here and how much I haven't. But, um, hmm. Okay. Yeah, I'll install um, libgcc473. Let's try that. You all can see my screen, right? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. oh, oh, up to date. Sorry. Um, okay, how about the JPEG? Uh, well, I'm not sure if I can find an example here because uh, it's, it's hard to remember exactly what I've installed on this VM and what I haven't. Um, but. Gen but if, if I install something which contains a DLL which is already on the system, it will detect it and pop up a warning. And the same with executables. So that's not foolproof, but I think it goes a long way to um, avoiding this, so, this kind of um, collision of, of DLL, DLL hell as you call it. Uh, let's try USB oh, calls. That might it might have it. Uh, it's not good. It's not a good chance. Uh, no, it doesn't. Okay. <laughs> oh right, it's a VM. I don't have USB installed. <laughs> well, yeah, I think you get the idea. Um, does that answer your question, anyway, Robert? Yes. Thanks. Okay. Any any last questions? Oh. Okay. All right then. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I guess you uh, might.
the TV back, right? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Good night from Japan. Bye. I'll, be, I'll switch over to IRC now. Bye. Bye. So long, Alex.